stream of pressurized air comes out of the tip. That air is charged. That's what creates the plasma. And that's what melts through the steel. Just as lightning charges air and turns it into a plasma, the electric current in the cutter does the same. It charges the air, turns it into a jet of plasma, and that's what melts the metal very quickly. This is staggering, the speed. It's actually three times faster than an oxyacetylene cutter. But there's absolutely no sense, of course, of resistance. There's no effort to it from me. I'm just moving along the surface of the metal. Plasma cutting is brilliant for big metal construction because it's quicker than oxyacetylene. It also creates a much cleaner cut, so it needs less finishing, and that speeds production yet further. Just air and electricity doing that. The power of lightning. Plasma cutting on a grand scale was the secret behind making the Milab Bridge road deck. Here at the Eiffel Metal Construction Company, yes, the same Eiffel that built the Paris Tower, the lightning heat of the plasma cutters sliced over 2,000 steel segments in just two years. So that's how the deck of the world's longest cable-stayed bridge was built by controlling the power of lightning. But once they'd created the road deck, they faced another challenge, putting it in place without toppling the colossal towers built to hold it up. A lucky accident that reinvented the frying pan would solve this problem. The Milan Bridge engineers had to somehow launch their steel road across the top of the giant concrete piers. But to achieve this, they had to devise a radical new delivery technique. On your regular bridge, there's kind of two main ways of getting the deck onto the piers. First of all, you build your piers, which I'm doing here with bread, obviously. There we go, that's my piers. Then, you can either build sections of your deck actually on site and crane them into position. And there's my bridge complete or option two you can build the whole deck and push it out over the piers from the sides of the valley until it's in place perfect but Milau is not your regular bridge for one thing because of the depth of the valley they're trying to cross the piers are not little squat ones like these they're great big tall ones like these which means once they'd actually got these into place 240 meters tall the expense difficulty and complications of using cranes to lift the sections of road bridge up were just immense so you go for the second option you build the deck you push it out but with piers this high 240 meters the sideways force of the deck would just topple them and disaster this is the engineer's solution, a special hydraulic jack. It uses two giant wedges which slide across each other to lift and move the steel deck over the piers. Using wedges means that the road deck is lifted and slid forward in one move, avoiding any pushing against the piers. Then, as the second wedge is pulled out, the deck is lowered to sit back down on top of the piers. Both wedges then reset to start the cycle again. Each cycle lifts and moves thousands of tonnes of steel, a modest 60 centimetres. But over 15 months, the giant road deck was slid precisely and safely into place. It's incredibly simple, but very, very clever. There's just one thing. 36,000 tonnes of decking are pressing down on top of these wedges. They have to be able to slide over one another to work. Well, to do that, the engineers had to rely on the most slippery substance ever created. Back in 1938, chemist Roy Plunkett was working to improve the efficiency of fridges, but he ended up making an amazingly slippery powder. He'd made PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, known the world over by its famous brand name, Teflon. 
New black, no stain Teflon. Even hours after cooking, pans rinse clean in seconds. No soaking, no scouring. Teflon inside. It really is the slipperiest thing made by mankind. And that sounds like something that's got to be put to the test, which is where my friend Warwick comes in. Right. Well, when I say my friend Warwick, it's more Boris. Yes, Boris. Boris is a gecko. He's uh, got the stickiest feet, I would say, in the animal kingdom. This is Boris the gecko, performing for us the gecko test on a piece of glass. Well, that's Boris quite happily. There you go. That's vertical, maybe even a bit more, and he's. That's glass gecko tested by Boris. <laughs> now we must test Teflon. So, All right. let's perform the gecko test. Um, I've just realised this might be quite disconcerting for Boris, but I don't... Boris, don't think what I know you're now thinking. <laughs> We're using frying pan because it's coated with the material, not because of you know, the cooking thing. OK. I'm sorry, Boris, I'm really sorry. But, but I wouldn't blame him if he jumped straight out of this. Right, so let's try him on this. Oh, not a home. <laughs> really can't. Well, clearly then, our non-stick material passes the internationally recognised gecko test with ease. No, it, it's, it's gecko proof. I think that really is the final word from our gecko tester. Teflon really is very, very slippery. Once the launch had begun, there was no going back. And PTFE proved itself on the wedges, sliding the massive steel road deck over the valley. All thanks to the wonder non-stick stuff called Teflon, discovered by luck in a nap. Now the engineers had to face their next big problem. How to construct the tallest piers ever built, each to a specific point in the sky with millimetre precision. The highest of these giants is 245 metres, as tall as a 70-storey skyscraper. And the other six aren't exactly short. They all had to end up in exactly the right place, within millimetres. They were only possible with the technology from the submarine war games of the Cold War. Engineers analyse the stresses and strains on the bridge round the clock, 365 days a year. This is the control room where today cameras and sensors monitor the traffic, the wind, temperature and humidity. But back then, when the bridge was under construction, it was, if anything, under even closer scrutiny. Reflectors dotted about over the structure allowed the engineers to track the build and monitor the bridge's precise position. The engineers needed to build each towering pier up to a precise point in space, hundreds of metres above the ground, so it could meet the horizontal deck as it slid out, thousands of metres from the valley sides. A precise surveying network ensured that they got to exactly the right point in space, to within millimetres, impossible without a supremely accurate system of measurement. The kind you'd need to find a dot in the ocean. Q and next connection. It all started when US nuclear submarines began to get lost. The subs were designed to submerge for months with gyroscopic systems to record every move. But over time, tiny errors mounted up. When the subs surfaced out in the middle of the ocean, they couldn't work out where they were. A precision nuclear weapon is not much use if you don't know which way to point it. The US Navy's solution was to launch satellites. On surfacing, the subs would listen for the satellite signal to work out where they were. It was the very first use of satellites for global navigation, the foundation of today's global positioning system, or GPS as we all know it. But how does it actually work? And how could a signal beamed from 20,000 kilometres away help engineers build a bridge to millimetre accuracy? The trick is to calculate how long a signal takes to get to Earth. If you know its speed and when a signal was sent, you can work out distance very accurately. 
To see just how this works, I'm meeting John Shelton, an expert in the field of acoustics. In a field 